I am glad to introduce you to John Traxler. It's, he is one of the pioneers in using mobile technologies for learning. Professor Traxler, uh, among many other things, is the director of the Learning Lab at the University of Wolverhampton. He's also the director of the International Association for Mobile Learning, as well as a member of several uh, journal editorial boards. And he's also related to many conferences related to mobile technologies. Today he will talk about using mobile devices for learning in Africa. And as you can see in the screen, he will pose a very interesting question. Are mobiles too good to be true? And we are, well, really, uh, I'm sure that we really enjoy this last talk that will be a, an excellent uh, conclusion for, for this seminar before the final debate. So uh, please, John, when you want, you can proceed. OK, thanks very much. Um, I'm conscious of a kind of responsibility of being at the end and, and um, worried that it says Africa in the title, so everyone's going to be expecting um, elephants and um, villages and expecting to go away happy. Um, I think probably all of those expectations are ill-founded. You're going to go away miserable and confused and you're not going to see any elephants. Um, nevertheless, um, I'll start on, a, on an upbeat note because, I mean, I guess... Um, mobile learning in development in, for example, African contexts ought to be a no-brainer. Um, poor infrastructure, no buildings, um, good mobile phone coverage, universal ownership, um, uh, a um, awareness of the, where the next billion subscribers is, uh, where, where the next billion subscribers are coming from, ought to make mobile learning. Uh, in Africa, like I say, a no-brainer. Um, now, I mean, sadly, I don't think it is. And I sa sadly, I think it's, it's deeply problematic. And I suppose, actually, I go to conferences in Africa, and very quickly, I, I start wondering, am I part of the problem, or am I part of the solution? Um, I've been working in mobile learning for, I don't know, maybe about 2002, and working in development as well. Um, and so I'm conscious of the... Um, the work that goes on in both those communities. I mean, for example, in ICT for D, or, or even in the, the relatively new M for D community, Mobiles for Development. And looking at mobile learning and looking at um, development, actually, you have, whenever you say development, if, to be politically correct, you have to say development. Um, otherwise, you beg kind of questions about progress and Western values and all sorts of stuff that you'd rather not unpack. Um, but anyway, what, what, have, what have mobile learning and uh, development got in common? Well, they consist of hundreds and hundreds of small-scale, fixed-term projects that don't go anywhere. That, that's right, it's probably rather ironic about mobile learning not going anywhere, but I mean, they just stop. Um, uh, and yet, on the other hand, what we see is quite a lot of publicity, uh, visibility for um, some kind of flagship projects, you know, the Grameen phone project, for example. Um, and I think... Uh, so I think I worry that the mobile learning community is, is quite self-referential. Uh, we all like telling ourselves how much we've achieved. Uh, we get a bit concerned we are try when we try and tell the rest of the world that, because it's not kind of necessarily based on good evidence. <laughs> um, and what we see in looking at these kind of flagship projects is maybe a kind of cherry picking. Um, now recently, I think, somewhere in the States, with the uh, Mobile Active Group, what we saw was a real breakthrough, people coming together to talking about their failed projects. And we could do with more of this because at the moment, as I say, we seem to be cherry picking those few um, projects that are successful and thinking we understand enough about their context or their mechanics to actually generalize or abstract or replicate or transfer. And I think a lot of our problems lie in that kind of thinking process that, uh, that happens. Um, and actually also I've noticed, for example, in doing evaluation in, in Kenyan schools, um, I, I did kind of field work going from school to school to school, and I, I went with an educationalist and a technologist and a ministry official. And the analysis you bring with you, uh, sorry, you bring an analysis with you and that's the one that explains the situation. So the technologist would say, yeah, fabulous, it's a success, that must be because of the technology. And the educationalist will say, fabulous, it worked because good teachers, good pedagogy, good curriculum. 
and the ministry official will say good staff development, good training structure, good support, you know. And so it's very difficult to reach a sensible, robust analysis of what's going on when a lot of what's going on is actually the stuff that you bring to the situation rather than um, the situation. So I think there are quite a few opportunities to um, put our foot in it. Um, and one set, of my, one set of worries or expectations or whatever is around the idea of, of progress. This is um, near where I live. It's the world's first iron bridge. Um, but because it's the world's first iron bridge, it's built like a wooden one. It's just built out of iron. Um, and so one of the ideas uh, that we bring with us about progress might be the idea that things are going to just carry on in roughly the same way, uh, that we're just going to manage to achieve things that were previously difficult that we can, we can actually extrapolate. Um, and in fact, there's a, a kind of, maybe is it an urban myth that, that the first thing you do with a new technology, you do this. You solve problems that, that were difficult. Then you solve problems that were previously impossible. Then you solve problems that were previously inconceivable. Um, and I think I'd argue that mobile technology looked at in relation to static technology, it is straining to make that jump to the impossible or the inconceivable. And clearly, actually, thinking about the inconceivable is quite difficult because once you've thought about it, you've conceived it. So, um, so I mean, I think that the idea of progress, which I'll come back to, is, is problematic. Um, uh, but the idea of progress is deeply embedded in, um, I think, how we think about e-learning in Africa. Um, this is quite a graphic description of what might be going on. Um, well, this is quite a benign description of what might be going on in e-learning in Africa. Um, and we make comparisons, and one of, the, one of the obvious comparisons with mobile learning is it's going to be like static e-learning. And another obvious comparison that we think will help us reason about mobile learning in Africa is it's going to be like mobile learning in Europe. Um, but actually, there's a, there's a fairly pessimistic account of what e-learning is doing in Europe that I worry might then get transferred across to Africa. Um, there's an argument that actually e-learning is turning our universities and our colleges into factories. It's just part of mass production. It's just part of the industrialization of learning. Um, and therefore, that, in that context, what we might see is e-learning being used to industrialize learning in Africa. What we might see is mobile learning used to kind of sex up uh, learning in Europe. And so all of, all of those factors are kind of at work when I think about e-learning in Africa being a suitable kind of analogy or way of thinking about um, mobile learning as a possibility for progress in Africa. I, I also worry about whether or not what we're doing uh, is a kind of Trojan horse. So I hope there aren't, aren't too many cultural references in this. We all, yeah, sorry, it's, it's our common Mediterranean heritage, Trojan horses. Right, OK. Um, Someone made the remark to me that, that um, there is no neutral technology. I mean, this is a bit obvious, I suppose. There is no neutral technology. They've all got some kind of ideology embedded in them. And in our case, that ideology is a pedagogy, amongst other things. I dare say it's got all sorts of other cultural baggage embedded in the technology as well. Um, but if we look at what we do, and when we look at Africa's enthusiasm for adopting our educational technologies, um, at, the very soup, at the very top level, we are s selling technologies which embody the ideas of, of personalization and individualism. And I've talked to people from South Africa about that, black South Africans, they think that's a horrendous idea. Um, you know, the idea of individualism. They'd much prefer kind of, as it were, communism or collectivism. And yet the whole of Western education seems to be predicated on competitive individualism. Um, uh, I think VLEs, which are horrendously popular uh, and also horrendously unaffordable in Africa, thank goodness, um, embodies ideas of maybe social constructivism. Now, I'm not sure how well they travel to other cultures, those ideas. I mean, I, mean, I guess there's also a kind of, th the most superficial level, a way in which we're kind of selling a lock-in to particular technologies, um, particular platforms, as well as particular pedagogies. And I think we're also, uh, what's a another part of the ideology embedded in these technologies is a kind of Western epistemology, how we understand the world around us. Um, and we hear talk in Africa about oral culture, oral wisdom, 
veneration of, um, I don't know, received wisdom, um, tacit and informal knowledge in communities, um, the value of storytelling. Uh, and I worry that our technologies embedding, uh, sorry, embodying our ideology and pedagogy risk just steamrolling, steamrollering over that. Um, I, I made the mistake in one conference in Africa of saying mobile learning allows us to take learning into communities that were previously too remote for other initiatives, which is a bit like saying Columbus discovered America. Um, there were people there already. Uh, and actually, all of these communities have ha learning. Um, uh, what we risk is, is damaging kind of fragile educational communities um, with the power of our technology. But if you look on the bright side, very, very briefly, um, then um, there's always the activity of appropriation going on. Technology is not being used for what they were intended for. So for example, SMS and Teflon frying pans would be two classic examples. Uh, you know, SMS was intended for telemetry, but actually it quickly got subverted and appropriated by teenagers. Um, and we see the missed calls phenomenon around the world being appropriated and used by everyone. And in South Africa, they're called please, uh, please call me. Is that true? Yeah. And they're the most popular traffic on the, were the most popular traffic on the African, um, South African phone network. Um, now, that's clearly an appropriation because I don't think the networks provided phones so that we could all make uh, calls which don't generate any, any revenue. Um, so maybe, yes, there is a, a ideology embedded in our technology, but maybe people will appropriate it for their own ideologies. Another example is mosquito nets. They've been widely distributed um, by the benign West uh, for malaria, but they often get used for fishing. Um, and, uh, you know, the donors are appalled. What's gone wrong? You know, but actually if they knew more about the context and if they worried about the concerns of the people, well, actually maybe starving tomorrow is probably more challenging than a mosquito bite in a fortnight's time. I, I also worry about this, the, um, the fact that our technologies may act as a kind of cargo cult. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this idea, but the idea that sorry, these, are South, uh, these are South Pacific Islanders that had uh, American troops stationed on their islands in the 1940s, and they saw these American troops build a hut, put an aerial up, talk into a little box, and then sooner or later a plane, uh, an, an iron bird would appear out of the sky, and out would come stuff, cargo. So when the Americans left, all of these communities started building little shacks and building a, a bamboo aerial and talking into a box, and they thought something was going to come out of the sky. Well, it, it didn't. Uh, but I think that technology is laden with that kind of baggage as well. Um, um, I mean, I think it, it is laden with the baggage that, of, of catching up and leapfrogging, for example. Um, but I also think that we kind of, without actually inspecting it very much, we, we assume that uh, we're going to solve problems that we couldn't hope to solve. Now, one might be the problem of poverty, another might be the problem of hunger. Um, and actually, no way our phones or education are going to make people, you know, you can't eat phones. Um, and the reason p people are poor is because they haven't got any money. Um, and if you th look at how, for example, mobile phones, th their impact on um, remote and rural and developing economies, it's very, very complicated. If you look at the impact of education, it's very, very complicated. And I don't think we can make just kind of global assumptions that they need education, they need technology, they'll crack it. You know, everyone will be rich and uh, won't be hungry. I think there's also a, um, a, a, oh, sorry, this is specifically English. We had a king called Canute who was Danish. Uh, oh, Norwegians, they are Norwegians here. Uh, who thought that he just had to sit at the seaside and he could tell the sea to stop. Okay. Um, and we've had a, a way of looking at technology kind of historically, over the, uh, educational technology, over the last, um, say, 20 years, which is to do with it being uh, procured and delivered and managed and controlled by the institutions. A top-down process, a, a centre-out process. And I'm not sure if in Africa, um, or indeed in many of our, our, our educational context in, in Western Europe, we've noticed actually that it's no longer top-down, it's no longer big, heavy institutional technology, it's not laptops on desks that you can roll out, trickle down, it's actually um, outside in, 
the population is more technologically sophisticated than us. Uh, you know, kids talk about powering down at school. Um, and that's just as true in Africa as it is in Europe. Uh, you know, their educational institutions are incredibly infrastructurally challenged, but most people have access to some kind of phone, some kind of coverage. Um, and that's actually an opportunity because it actually means that the population is buying educational technology, but it's also a challenge in terms about loss of control, authority, teachers worrying about, you know, the locus of control shifting from the teacher um, to the users. Um, and, and for example, there are attempts to negotiate, if you like, new policies of acceptable use in schools and universities. You know, it was easy to have policies of acceptable use when we had uh, networked computers, VLEs in schools and colleges because we controlled them and if people didn't use them right, we'd throw them off. But now we're saying, well, we need to exploit ownership within the students, but how do we control? What, what's the new etiquette, behaviour, right and wrong behaviour? You know, where, how does one negotiate that? And again, there have been attempts in South African schools to do that, and, it, and you know, and that's that's very very useful. But actually, in South Africa as well as in Europe, um, teachers find the fact that uh, learners have their own devices uh, as quite challenging. Okay, a biblical metaphor this time. This is the uh, the 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 sower of seeds. Yeah, okay, and the the story that that some fell on stony ground. Um, going back to the problems of sustainability, why have we had so many projects in mobile learning and in development that fell on stony ground? Um, and so I'm sorry if anyone's heard me, heard me say this before, but I worry that what we've looked at is the sower and the seed, and we haven't looked at the ground. That what we've got is um, agencies, donors, ministries who want to fund good projects and they hope that good projects will come, become sustainable. Um, and what we actually need is, is a, a change in the paradigm so that they fund sustainable projects in the hope that they become good. Uh, because they need to look at the, the local context, institutions, culture, values. And if one did a kind of experiment saying, for example, what kind of innovation would your students tolerate it'd be in this space. What kind of innovation would your staff tolerate it'd be in that space? What kind of innovation would your maybe your infrastructure tolerate it'd be in that space? And okay, that that those axes define the space where you hope you can put a sustainable uh, innovation. But we don't ask that question about what's the target. And we end up with projects which go all over the place and don't hit that target where sustainability might be a, a possibility. Um, and as I say, you're probably more familiar with mobile learning, but I think it's exactly the case tr in um, um, development as well. Partly maybe complicated by the what's often a, 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 a chasm between official, ministerial, bureaucratic culture and informal community street culture um, and almost a tension that if it was sustainable or acceptable in one it probably wouldn't be sustainable or acceptable in the other I mean that might be true truer in some African countries than in other but in, but in Kenya there is a big discrepancy mistrust about the government it has little credibility the ministries have little credibility so who do you talk to do you start at the top and work down and have no credibility do you start at the bottom and work up um, uh, again, that's kind of one of the perennial questions. Okay, so um, I come from a country of uh, what we call big government, uh, and that's a country where the expectation is um, that researchers will conduct research, small research, that will generate some evidence, and maybe that evidence will be compelling enough that a, a, a government agency will run a bigger project to look at longitudinal studies um, and that those longitudinal studies will change policy and release public money. Um, uh, Jill would probably have an interesting 
insight into whether I'm just this is, whether I'm living in a fantasy world actually. Um, but certainly, you know, there's the there's the expectation in our countries or Scandinavia or Singapore um, that the government will deal with problems in health, education, um, public utilities, or whatever. Uh, and I can understand the role of research in that kind of environment. I, I might be, you know, optimistic, but at least I can see how it should work. Um, and so I can see the role of evidence. But if we look at other countries, um, countries of small government, like the US, like South Africa, and I made this remark to someone before uh, with a South African in the audience, a, a man called Johannes Kronja, and he, he assumed when I said small government, it was a euphemism for bad government, but actually it wasn't. I, w I was just talking about cultures where there isn't the expectation that the government and the taxpayer pick up the tab. Um, okay, so what's the, what is, is it that pilots and researchers should be doing? Just endless research, endless pilots. You know, what's the next step? How do you how do you take it further? And and that's a big question in much of Southern Africa, not only because of an ideology of small government, but actually of, as it were, incapable government. You know, where you can have whole ministries where no one has uh, education beyond secondary. Um, that is a, a, a big, big problem. Interestingly, um, I, I saw Bill Gates speak at the ICTD conference in Doha, I think a year ago, a year and a half ago, and th that was a very clear um, depiction of, of a paradigm, um, and I guess it's the paradigm that informs the Gates Foundation, but it was the, the paradigm of the hero innovator, uh, the problem solver, uh, the, the technocrat, the, 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 the magic bullet, you know, and we would do malaria, the tuberculosis. You know, we can solve, there is a, a specific technical intervention, bang, 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 that we will solve problems. Um, and maybe that's how, um, uh, in environments of small government, maybe that's how we make progress. I'm, I'm not sure. Many people would kind of question the efficacy of that model. Um, I mean, it's certainly in, in projects I've looked at where there's been a, uh, an obvious visionary, yeah, it works brilliantly. Then the visionary goes back to Europe or the visionary retires. Or, and then, um, you know, there's a different form of um, lack of sustainability. Um, to kind of explore this a bit more, this is uh, Brighton Clock Tower. Uh, see, I said no elephants. Um, this is Brighton Clock Tower. It's a, a, a model of the British Empire, a symbol of the British Empire. Um, it it um, symbolises hierarchy, punctuality, and hygiene. Um, there's a picture of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert in the middle. That's hierarchy. Um, there's a clock at the top. That's punctuality. Uh, and there's public toilets. I was going to say at the bottom, but that would be a dreadful pun. Um, lower down. Um, now, this was built uh, in the, well, say 200 years ago, no, 150 years ago, in a very kind of rampant free enterprise society where people needed to go to the toilet. But it's actually quite difficult seeing a business model around going to the toilet. Um, but I guess in conversations with um, commercial um, and industrial organizations operating in our space, who might be the handset manufacturers, might be the, um, the networks, might be publishers. This is kind of the place we're in. Um, there must have been some business model that got pipes, civil engineering done for money, um, but I'm not sure exactly what it was. Um, so I think in, in looking at how, um, as a research community, we engage with the commercial sectors, this is the point at which we're kind of stuck. We'd like public toilets, but exactly what's the business case? Um, I'm, I'm not, by the way, saying that Africa is like Europe was 150 years ago, before you catch me out on that. Anyway, in, in my search for a viable business case, that was all I could find. 
Um, um, and as I say, what we're looking for is some way of bringing together a kind of ecology that might consist of um, uh, publishers, networks, handset manufacturers, and so on, in a sustainable form that moves on from the kind of project economy, you know, where we all write a bid, we do a project for two years, we publish it, and then we look for the next funder. Moving on from that um, and finding models that are more sustainable. Something that occurred to me this morning, actually, was when we deal with corporates, what I, in the, in, and, and actually universities can behave like corporates as well. If you look at how kind of universities are pushing themselves into a global market, then let's not think all universities are benign. You know, some just want the next busload of students from India signed up and, um, but anyway, I'm conscious that what I'm talking about on the one hand is global and is kind of differentiated by country or region or language. Um, and so there is a global perspective and sometimes corporate organizations, global cor corporate organizations bring that perspective um, to mobile learning in development. But actually what they don't necessarily bring is a consciousness of, if you like, the digital divide, uh, of deprivation, of poverty. Um, it's not just a case of finding a business model that fits in all the various different contexts and doing some localization. Um, there is something going on as well. Okay, so I thought I'd just show a couple of, of uh, kind of not so typical interventions that I've been involved in. And this is a, um, this is a corporate intervention in South Africa. Uh, um, and, and what it taught me was, I suppose, again, the problems, the challenges of dealing with the kind of non, um, I don't know, research philanthropy community, as it were. Sorry, that's not to say corporates aren't philanthropic, but that, clearly that's not their, uh, their bottom line. I mean, their bottom line is their bottom line. Um, it taught me that they deal in very short timescales by our standards, you know, some months. Uh, they want to intervene, see some results, move on. They might want to intervene, take some photographs and move on. Um, and s certainly, you know, from a methodological point of view, that's quite problematic. You know, the Hawthorne effect is at work. You know, all of a sudden, um, a Land Rover arrives with lots of Europeans, everyone acts up, everyone acts up for the camera. Um, um, the novelty doesn't wear off. Um, and there are issues about embedding, you know, in those kind of timescales. Has anyone got used to it yet before the show's over and the circus has left town? Um, I think I, there is also the possibility for behavior that is quite kind of ethically abrasive, that, that doesn't necessarily take into account in different local cultures, be they virtual or real, um, how different communities would see the issues of harm, embarrassment, self-esteem, um, and, to, and to brush those aside. Um, that isn't to say university-based researchers can't do exactly the same thing, uh, but you know, I'm drawing attention to ethical issues at work in these kinds of contexts. And they're at work partly because of the big differences, cultural differences between us as maybe European, uh, middle-class educated researchers and cultures which are maybe informal, speak different languages, not, sophist well, not sophisticated in our terms, and, not understand and us not understanding what's going on in those cultures and not managing to get to the, um, the, the back story. You know, only ever hearing, you know, sorry, I've, I've uh, arrived in UNDP Land Rovers for do an to do an evaluation. Uh, and they clearly kind of cost most of the gross domestic product of the country in question. And we've got out, it's been a rural school, 50 kids have kind of gathered around us, eyes wide open. And our driver has said, this is Mr. So-and-so, he's from uh, DFID, they are paying half a million pounds for this project. This is Mrs. So-and-so, she's from the ministry, she's responsible for your training. Uh, this is Traxler, he's a researcher from the UK. He's, he's, this project was his idea. Now tell us if you like it. Um, yeah, so, you know, especially when there's pressure on time, 
it's very difficult to get, as I say, a kind of backstory, uh, a, a backstage story. I mean, it's, it's often a problem, I think, with evaluation where there's a cultural difference. So it might be with homeless people using mobiles in Europe just as much. Um, okay, so those were my concerns in this particular context, um, that the, the pressure and the rush, and maybe looking for, um, because of the, the, the short-termism or the rush, looking for kind of hard outcomes, maybe cognitive ones, you know, pre and post tests. Now, somewhere I remember being told that education was what you were left with when you'd forgotten everything you'd been taught. Well, okay, if that's true, then this kind of pre and post test and the emphasis on hard outcomes, uh, you know, with no, no attention to um, attitudes or effective learning or whatever, it, you know, is gonna lead us up um, a blind alleyway, I think. There's an alternative. Uh, uh, I was in South Africa two months last year um, working at the Maraca Institute. And um, in a set, they, they are technologists. They're driven by the Ministry of or the Department of Science and Technology, and that's their remit to develop stuff. Um, and it's a, it's a unidirectional trajectory. It starts with the technologists and it ends up in the community. Um, but, but the problem is it doesn't always doesn't often end up in the community. Um, and it's easy enough to construct, if you like, a kind of logical positivist experiment where we put kids in a school, in a classroom for a period, um, and we give them an, a, a technology. And we can do that well, and we, or we could do it badly. So we could have a, a longitudinal study. But it's effectively a kind of closed experiment that doesn't tell you much uh, beyond the pedagogic and the technical. And that would be good, maybe in Scandinavia, because we'd know what should happen next, that we would take the evidence to the ministry and they would give us lots of money. Um, but in South Africa, for example, that's not gonna happen because there isn't that kind of expectation about, about government. And so Maraca are looking at the possibility um, of living labs, where the institute establishes an ongoing relationship with different communities in different parts, rural parts of South Africa, in the hope that instead of a kind of closed experiment, it becomes an open experiment, um, where there is serendipity, um, where we might see a, a increased chance of social entrepreneurs catching the idea and turning it into something viable. So that's, if you like, kind of third stream. That's a, a middle way, to use Tony Blair's um, you know, on the one hand, we've got a kind of state, big government. On the other hand, we've got kind of maybe philanthropy, foundations, corporations, and then the possibility, the possibility uh, of social enterprises. But I think that they are very fragile um, social enterprises. Um, th this is a, a very brief reference to a project in Kenya, trying to work with um, local farmers, organic farmers in, for sustainable agriculture. And that ran, ran in, in, in my mind, into lots of problems. But it started out from the bottom up. And kind of that's where it stayed. Because um, in Kenya, as I say, there is a big gap in faith, credibility, between local people in communities and, and governments. Um, last couple of examples. Um, this is a project I was responsible for in Kenya which, in which we attempted to um, devise a open and distance learning program for in-service training of primary teachers nationally. So the target audience was about 200,000 um, teachers funded by DFID and the World Bank. Um, and in the end, uh, well, part, part of what we developed was... Uh, and for which I'm responsible, was a, effectively an SMS-based VLE. Um, so if you like, this is um, an example of progressive social constructivist education um, embedded in a technology that went nowhere. And I have maybe 400,000 text messages in a, in a spreadsheet where I can look at uh, people arranging uh, gymnastic events, people... Um, uh, arranging to go on a date with each other, people arranging musical events, people discussing Germany getting knocked out of the World Cup, all sorts of things, but no social constructivism. It, it is just alien 
to um, that particular you know teacher primary teacher community within um, uh, within Kenya and probably lots of other parts of Kenya. Um, as an aside, part of the development process was called capacity building. So the idea was I didn't do anything. I worked with Kenyan technologists. Actually, I worked with a company called Cellulant, who claim they are the lords of the ringtones. Um, and the idea of capacity building, as I say, is you stand behind local technologists, local educators. But when someone mentioned uh, neo-colonialism yesterday, I thought, oops, yes, is that what um, capacity building is? It's just a way of kind of impregnating uh, institutions at a distance with a, a particular set of values. Um, I don't know. I mean, I find the whole thing deeply problematic. Uh, even more problematic, maybe at an ethical level, because capacity building is really slow. Um, and I was confronted with the information we were gathering would be used to um, support the infant feeding program. That one in six kids in Kenya is uh, an orphan because of, the, of uh, HIV AIDS. And we were also using SMS to gather school statistics nationally. Uh, and it wasn't a complex technology. Uh, some of us could have probably built it quite quickly, but we weren't building it. The Kenyans were building it. We were building capacity. And in the meantime, there was a quantifiable number of Kenyan children who would die because they weren't getting milk powder. Um, just to make the issue more complex, um, having said that this World Bank funded um, initiative was only a partial success, uh, it was run with lots of very big meetings, very informal, chaotic meetings uh, where everyone would turn up. You know, uh, we were the only game in town. Come and have lunch with us. Um, and at one point, the Kenyan National Educational Examination Council came in, had a coffee, and said to my colleague and myself, uh, a Kenyan called uh, Leonard Mariulu, um, we have a problem with um, corruption within the system for reporting registrations for exams. It's not transparent, it's not efficient, and we think it's corrupt. And we just made a casual remark, ah, oh, put an advert in the newspaper, set up an SMS line, charge them premium rate. The parents can then find out what their kids have been enrolled for. Bingo. Efficiency, transparency, and you make a profit. And they did. They do. Um, and this is one of my, a consequence of it. This is, I think it's launched a few. Now, this was the result not of the World Bank spending half a million pounds. It's the result of a casual remark uh, across lunch. So, and I worry that had the World Bank wanted to improve the transparency of the Kenyan examination system, it wouldn't have happened. They would have spent half a million pounds, we would have all gone home, and it would have been a dreadful failure. So I'm not sure what I'm telling you. Um, but I think also we need to address the problem in Africa as much as anywhere else that um, what mobile technologies are doing, well, two things really. One is they actually allow communities to, to generate and discuss and store and transmit ideas and information and images. Now that's learning. Um, and there are whole communities cut off, as it were, uh, choosing to be cut off from what the rest of us call learning. For example, people who live in the world of Warcraft. Um, uh, now who's to say that's not learning and not important learning? Um, but we have to recognize it's a long way from the it's a long way from the current way that the M for D community sees education, which is about service delivery. Um, you know, it's about just kind of making the machinery run better. But it's also very difficult for the institutions, maybe donors or, or ministries or universities or schools, to get their heads round. Um, you know, how do you engage with these communities? How do you build on what they are valuing as learning? Um, I don't, I, so. That is a challenge, but of course, um, sorry, this is a photograph taken during the July bombings in 19, sorry, 20, 2005, I think, in, in London. And it's an art, it, it's a, um, taken by a pedestrian. It's an example of what we were told was called citizen journalism. Uh, it's just outside the British Medical Association and that, bomb, that bus has just been blown up. Um, and citizen journalism is being presented as 
democratisation. It allows news to be disseminated without the control of the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Information, the BBC, um, News International. So it's portrayed as, as democratisation. Um, and it allows learners to generate their own material as well as uh, just the, the, the general public. But actually, it's not necessarily a good thing because what we're talking about is the way in which knowledge is being broken down into different communities. It's maybe just more local or more transient. And this picture could have been taken by a bomber, in which case the spin would have been entirely different. This isn't plucky Londoners, uh, you know, being brave whilst bombs go off. This is um, uh, a legitimate target. Um, and we can propagate that message just as easily as we can propagate the one about brave Londoners. Um, so I think when we talk about a continent where mobile um, is the prevalent technology, we have to worry about, is this, demo is this really democratization? To what extent are we opening up um, learning and knowledge and information? Um, or is it actually problematic? Uh, and is it a, a serious challenge? Uh, this is just a remark about uh, the, the digital divide, I suppose, because this is, you know, Prensky's digital immigrants, di digital natives. Um, and one of the abiding um, ways of conceptualizing the North and the South is as digital divides. And I, I worry, I suppose, that um, I think talking about digital divides, talking about emergent markets and mature markets, uh, set off an alarm for me that actually the reason we have so many problems with development is actually, and, and the re when I go to conferences in Africa, for example, about development, I invariably hear people talking about unexpected consequences. I hear them talking about multi-causality. Um, and I hear them talking about objectively veri verifiable indicators. Um, and all of this sounds like, well, modernism. You know, the, the, the mindset that dominated the European mind and maybe still does from the 18th century, you know, which is based on some um, fairly kind of straightforward headlines that kind of history is going somewhere, um, science is a good thing, education will make a better world, um, we can understand the world with the use of language, uh, that cause and effect are easy to understand. I mean, I, I, I'm sure if you've got a degree in philosophy, you'll, you'll think this is a ca kind of caricature. But nevertheless, it's actually the caricature which I think dominates much thinking about development and about progress. Um, and I think on the one hand, in Africa, as, once we get away from the University of Cape Town or the University of Pretoria uh, and start looking at um, informal and indigenous cultures, we are not talking about cultures permeated by modernism. We are talking about very different cultures. But if you then overlay on that the argument that um, mobile technologies in the way that they connect and transform and turn our societies into much more kind of fluid uh, entities, you know, there's an argument that they make any society a, a postmodern society um, or, or maybe a there's, there's variations on what, what you want to call it, but, I, but my, my core point is I think that the mindset that people bring to development is the wrong one, so I'm not surprised it doesn't work. Um, um, and finally, um, yeah, we're supposed to be talking about um, mobiles and technology and development uh, and learning, and I think we, we, it's very easy to get into a kind of closed debate where we all talk to each other and we actually, uh, oh, this is, a, uh, this is about iPods. Um, it, it's, quite, it's quite old, but it's about iPods. Uh, and the Grenadier Guards are uh, a military band that the Queen has to take around with her. Okay? Um, um, actually, there are people in our societies, um, you know, who don't have much technology and who don't have much education. But actually, there are issues of power and disempowerment um, at work uh, and, and maybe um, you know technology and learning on their own are not going to make uh, much of a difference. Uh, and that's from my friend Adele. Um, you can you can read what you like into it.